Good morning. Today, Pastor Peter Chin will share the message from Galatians 3, uh, 1 to 9. I will read in Korean and Rihanna will read in English. Hear the word of the Lord. 갈리아다 사람 여러분, 왜 그리 어리석습니까? 예수 그리스도께서 십자가에 못 박히신 것이 여러분의 눈앞에 생생한데 누가 여러분을 유혹하였습니까? 내가 여러분에게서 한 가지 알아볼 것이 있습니다. 여러분은 성령을 받은 것이 율법을 지켰습니까? 기쁜 소식을 듣고 믿기 때문입니까? 여러분은 그렇게도 어리석습니까? 여러분은 성령으로 시작했다가 이제는 여러분 자신의 노력으로 완전해지려고 합니까? 깊은 소식을 위해 많은 고난을 겪은 여러분이 이제 와서 그것을 버린다는 말입니까? You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain if it really was in vain? 하나님이 여러분에게 성령을 주시고 기적을 베풀어 주신 것은 여러분이 율법을 지켰기 때문입니까? 깊은 소식을 듣고 믿었기 때문입니까? 성령에는 아브라함이 하나님을 믿었으므로 하나님은 이 믿음 때문에 그를 위롭게 여기셨다라는 말씀이 있습니다. So again I ask, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? So also Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. 그러므로 믿음을 가진 사람들만이 진정한 아브라함의 후손이 된다는 것을 아십시오. 그리고 성경은 하나님이 믿음으로 이방인들을 위롭게 하실 것을 미리 내다보고 일찍이 아브라함에게 모든 민족이 너를 통해 복을 받을 것이다 라는 깊은 소식을 전했습니다. 그러므로 믿음으로, 믿음으로 사는 사람은 믿음을 가진 아브라함과 함께 복을 받습니다. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. This, This is, is the, the word, word of the, of the Lord. Lord. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about this idea about diversity in the church. And we were saying how diversity is such a key feature, a distinctive feature of the church that we know and we love here at RAC. And so we wanted to understand that a little more deeply because we have so many people who are fairly new to our church. And so we wanted to kind of understand diversity, understand how we approach diversity. And what we were saying was that diversity is not simply a good thing, but it's a God thing. It's really a gift that God gives the church and it's responsibility of the church. That the early church didn't just enjoy this gift, but that they would work hard to cultivate the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so that is um, something we talked about a couple of weeks ago. But in addition to that, what I began to realize is that there are other distinctive features of who we are as a church that it makes sense for us to know better as well. And so what I wanted to do is take a short sermon series to look at some of the other features of who we are as a church so that if we're new or we're old, we all get the sense that we're in it together. We all kind of have a shared understanding of who we are as a church so we can move together as one, even though we might be very new or very old to the church. And so the quality of the church that I wanted to explore today is the fact that RAC is a historic church. We are a historic church. And I mean that in a couple of sensibilities. First off, that we have been around since 1904. 
1904. Some of us may not know that, but if you go outside uh, to that corner, there is a cornerstone that was laid in 1954 when the sanctuary was built that shows that we've been here as Rainier Avenue Free Methodist Church since 1904. And it doesn't mean that we've just been in existence since 1904. We've been on this corner since 1904. And that makes us one of the longest standing institutions of the Rainier Valley. And so we are most certainly a historic church in that we have been here for that entire time. For 118 years, we have been doing ministry on this corner to this community. And that very much makes us a historic church in that way. When you've been around for 118 years, you can legally lay claim to the name historic church. I think we literally are a historical church in some way. But I mean that in a more intentional sense, in that Rack is also a historic church, in that we want to remain connected to the people and the stories of those who came before us. And so we're not historic just in the way that we've been around and been on a corner for a long time, but that we consciously want to remember the people who have come before us and the ministries that have happened in our church so that we can remain connected to them in an active way. And so we want to continue to live that, that connection out as a church. And that's another way in which we see ourselves as a historic church. And that continues to be something that, that guides us as a church, that we want to remain connected to the people and the stories and the ministries that have come before us. But I think it's good for us to take a moment just to unpack that and to see that as a value, because it's not a value in every church. And in fact, evangelicals often see it as a liability to be called a historic church named or marked by that phrase, we are not your grandmother's church. Anyone heard that before, that expression at some time? It's actually an advertisement that evangelical churches will use to try to attract people. We are not your grandma's church. We are not your grandpa's church. In this effort to say, hey, we're not traditional, we don't do things in an old-fashioned way, it will be relevant, we'll be kind of modern in a lot of ways. And so in some ways, it's a way of people attracting them to the church by saying explicitly, we are not connected to the past. And I understand that motivation. I understand where it comes from. I'm not really putting it down. I think I understand the idea of not being trapped in the past and having some freedom to do things in a new way, and I understand that. But I think we take a different approach where we wouldn't say that, where we would strive instead to feel connected to our history. And I want to establish kind of a common language or a motivation for us to do that together so we understand that really is something that we prize. And the way that I want to do that is by looking at the book of Galatians and understanding the book of Galatians a little bit. The book of Galatians is a letter that Paul writes to uh, a church. And it's very much for Gentiles or non-Jewish people. Paul himself was called the apostle to the Gentiles, meaning that he really had a heart for people who had grown up without Jewish context or traditions, who were Greek in culture or Hellenistic in culture. And so that was his heart. And the Galatian church was comprised of Gentiles, people who were not Jewish at all. And so the context of the, the book of Gentiles is a few different things. First off, that Paul himself had departed from his own religious heritage and traditions. Because we read this in Galatians chapter 1. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my father's. And so this was Paul's previous life where he was zealous in his Phariseeism, in his desire to uphold the standards of Jewish tradition. But we know that in the book of Acts, Jesus encounters him on the road to Damascus and sets him on a very different course. Instead of being a persecutor of the church, he becomes a leader of the church instead. And so that's Paul's story. Paul kind of steps away, at least to some extent, from this old life upholding the standards of Judaism to instead living out and leading the church instead. So that's one aspect of the church of Galatians. Another aspect of the church is this, that as Gentiles, the Galatians had almost no connection to the stories and the people from the Old Testament. 
And that's something that I think is lost on many of us because many of us were uh, maybe born and raised in church. And so the stories of the Old Testament and the New Testament, they just, we can't imagine anyone not knowing about Abraham and about Moses and about David. But there are those amongst us who have no context in the church and no history in the church. And so these stories and these names don't really mean all that much to us ultimately. That's exactly where the Galatian church was. When they heard Abraham, that wasn't a name that they recognized. When they heard about King David, they weren't in awe of that name or Solomon or any of these stories. They had really no cultural or emotional connection to any of these stories or any of these experiences. Not only that, the Galatians were not just unfamiliar with the Jewish context. In some ways, they were being marginalized by it. I've talked about this often, about the story of the Judaizers, that there was a sect of Jewish Christians who believed that in order to become Christians, you had to abandon your culture, abandon your heritage, and put that away and become fully Jewish in every way in order to become Christian. You had to fulfill the Mosaic law and traditions. You had to eat certain things. You had to become ritually circumcised if you were a male. And only then, when you had abandoned everything else culturally that you were, Could you become a full Christian? Because you had to be fully Jewish in order to be fully Christian. And this was a heresy that was taking root in the Galatian church where the Galatians were beginning to wonder, does that mean I have to leave behind everything that I grew up in? All of the culture that I knew, all those experiences, those have to be set aside for me to become a Christian instead. And so not only were they unfamiliar with the traditions and the stories of Judaism, they are actually being oppressed by it. They're being kind of put to the side or marginalized by those stories. And in fact, that's a big part of the context of the book of Galatians. That's what was read this morning from verse 1. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law, which is what the Judaizers would say, or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After, by begin, after beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain if it really was in vain? And so this is another piece of the book of Galatians that they were actually kind of being oppressed or marginalized by these traditions, being forced to abandon who they were in order to become Christians instead. So what I want to point out is that for these reasons, Paul had many reasons, or for for these factors, Paul had many reasons to try to distance the Galatian church from the stories and the people of the Old Testament. If anyone had kind of the motivation to say to the Galatian church, hey, you need to break from the past. You're no longer this Jewish church. You're a Christian church. It would have been the Apostle Paul to the Galatians. After all, he had stepped away from this, right? He had had a previous way of life where he was a Pharisee. He's not a Pharisee anymore. They don't even know these stories. They're not really important stories culturally to the Galatian church. And not only are they unimportant stories, but they're actually stories that are being used to oppress and to marginalize this church as well. And so for many reasons, Paul could have said, hey, this is not your grandmother's church. You shouldn't have to pay attention to any of that. Maybe he could have said what he said in 1 Corinthians. The old has gone. You're not Jews anymore. That's not important. Those stories, those people are no longer relevant to you. You are new. You are this novel, new thing that God is doing through Jesus Christ. Forget all of that. And that would have been a very good strategic maneuver. He could have put that on mailers saying, we're not your old church anymore. We're a new church instead. But in the very next verse of this chapter, he goes on to say this. So again, I ask, does God give you a spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law, what the Judaizers believed, or by believing what you heard? So also Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. 
And so in verses 1 through 5, he says, hey, don't buy into the heresy of the, of, of the, of the Judaizers. You don't need to uh, uh, become believers because of your works, because of what you're doing. Instead, it's by faith. But he doesn't just end there. He goes on to say this. You know who else had faith and was justified by faith? Abraham. And if you are justified by faith, guess what? You're children of Abraham. And you know what God told Abraham a long ago when he prophesied about the gospel? God told Abraham, all nations will be blessed by you, Abraham. And guess what? You're one of those nations. You, the Galatian church, you are one of the nations, one of the people that was prophesied all the way back in the book of Genesis. One of the people who will be blessed by Abraham and faith is you. He actually connects them to the story of Abraham and lets them know that they are the fulfillment of Abraham's promise. They are children of Abraham instead. Paul takes special effort to connect the Galatians to the Old Testament so they can be connected to a larger people and to a larger story. He doesn't tell the Galatians, hey, you're new. You're a brand new thing. Nothing has ever been seen like the Galatian church. No, he says you are part of a people. You are now part of the people of God. And you have people that you can look back to, uh, uh, heroes of the faith that you can feel connected to. You, just as much as I, as a, as a former Pharisee, are now children of Abraham. He connects them to a larger story and to a larger people. They're not independent. They are now a people. They are not new. They are something old and rich instead. And that is kind of the motivation that we want to use as we think about our nature as a historic church. That as RAC, we see our history as a strength because it connects us to a larger story and community. Or in other words, we are your grandmother's church. We are your grandmother's church. And I really want to point that out, that when we go back to our history, it's not in a way to shackle us and to make us do things in the same way. Because clearly, when you look at this new screen, we are not doing things in the same way that we did it before. But we do want to look to our past in order to feel connected, in order to feel like we, we are older and bigger than just the people who are sitting here. We want that. And there's a strength when we connect ourselves to those stories. And in fact, it's something that's very personal to me when I came to be a part of this church. When I came to be a part of Rainer Avenue Church, I knew nothing about this church whatsoever. I never have lived in the Pacific Northwest in Seattle. So I had no understanding of the context of this city. I knew nobody here at Rainer Avenue Church. There was not one single person that I knew from a previous kind of friendship or anything before. I actually had never heard of free Methodism before I came out here. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but it's just true. I didn't know anything. I had no connection. Kind of like what Paul's context in the book of Galatians, I was kind of similar in, in many ways. I didn't know any of this. I had no relational attachment, no theological attachment. I didn't know one person from the next. And so I think there was a temptation for me to come and say, hey, I'm brand new. Things are going to look different. Everything's going to look different here. And that was kind of something I was thinking about. How should I come? How should I engage with a church and a context in which I don't have any real kind of connection to? But when I came, I started to talk to people and I started to hear stories. And I started to speak to some of the elders here who told me they came here in 1955. In 955, right? After they had returned home from World War II, from service in World War II, they came and attended here. And they, this sanctuary was built in 1955 during their time. And I heard about their years of investment, about uh, people like Leonard Root and Ken Butts doing just, their fingerprints are literally around this church. Ken Butts uh, was confined to a wheelchair, but he actually used to change the oil of the pastors every single time it needed to happen. Even though he couldn't walk, he would actually change their oil. I have an electric car, and so my oil cannot be changed. <laughs> but just kind of a, a reminder of just decades of investment that happened throughout that time. And then they told me about a time um, in the late 70s and the early 80s where there was a massive uh, economic downturn in Seattle. And maybe some of you know about that. There were layoffs that were happening at Boeing. And Boeing was the, the larger empl largest employer of Seattle. And as a, re as a result of that, people were just fleeing out of the city. And this massive billboard was erected that said, um, last one out of Seattle, please turn out the lights. Maybe some of you have heard that story. And that actually began to affect 
our church as well. And during that time, I think from what I've heard, that Rainier Avenue Church dwindled down to about a dozen people. A dozen to 20 people were here remaining at Rainier Avenue Church. Because of that, the denomination came and approached the leaders, Leonard Rood and, and Gilbert Beckwith and their families, Edith Rood and Ken Butts and some others, Naomi Cotton, and said, hey, you've had 70 years of ministry here ever since 1904. That is a blessing. You couldn't ask for a better ministry. It's time to sell this property. It's time to move on. It's time to move with the rest of your community to wherever else they are going. And they told the denomin denominational leaders, no, we're not going. We feel called to this place. We feel like there is more that God wants to do through this church in this community, and we will grow with whoever comes. Even though our friends and the people that we know are moving, whoever comes, we will make a commitment to them. And so they basically said, no, we're not going to sell. What they didn't know is that the next wave of people who would be coming into this area would be immigrants, would be refugees from Laos and from Thailand and from Ethiopia and then later from Eritrea and from Somalia. They didn't know that. And so people, immigrants and refugees, people of color started to move into the Rainier Valley. And then World Relief came and approached our church and asked leaders, those 12 leaders of the church, hey, there are new people moving into your community. Do you want to befriend them? Do you want to stand with them and help them kind of get adjusted to this new life that they're experiencing? And what I heard is that in the seats that some of you are seated now, Gilbert Beckwith stood up and said, I'll do it. I'll be their friend. I'll take them to school, to the doctor's appointments, and whatever else needs to happen. And then others stood up alongside of him. And then as a result of that, the Lao Fellowship was established here in this church, from whom there are people amongst us right now who are a part of the Lao Fellowship and have been this entire time. And they began to invest in the schools with the Mekong Kids program that uh, uh, Van was a part of and the Graham Hill program that some of our staff had been a part of as well. And so I heard these stories when I first came, right? Again, not knowing any context, not having any real relationship or, you know, uh, you know denominational heritage. And I heard these stories and I thought, this is gold. This is gold. Why would you, why would you not want to continue to do these things? And so that became what I felt called to do, is to continue these stories. Not to do something brand new that you couldn't recognize, but instead to take this inheritance, to take these amazing stories, and to continue in a different way, but still to live them out. And really, when you think about it, so much of what we continue to do is just a modern-day continuation of what we've always done. We have what's called our international fellowship. See, we don't just have Lao immigrants in our church. Now we have people from Laos. We have people who speak Hindi. We have people from Thailand. We have people from really all over the world and from Nigeria and from Kenya. And so we have an international fellowship that continues to meet with Ada and Chris and with others who bring fellowship together for people from all around the world. We've spoken out on refugee issues. We've partnered with World Relief to establish our 1019 teams to welcome refugees during the refugee crisis. They came out of Syria. Naomi Cotton, who was one of those people who came in 1955, donated her house to us, to the church. We renovated as a home for refugees. So if you look across the street, you'll see the Naomi Cotton Friendship House. To this day, we've probably had maybe 24 families who have come to that house and have started off their journey there in the Naomi Cotton House, named after one of those elder saints. When people began to demonize refugees, saying that they're bringing all sorts of problems, we had some of our own refugee leaders come out and share their stories about coming to this country. We have Ron Com's place, which is our youth cafe, who is it named after? It's named after Ron Com Persert, one of those participants in the Lao Fellowship who served coffee every single Sunday for years and years and years. And now we do job training for youth who are part of our community. We've had other kind of ways to engage in our South Seattle community. We've had Space to Breathe, which was led by Leonetta and Michael Chu and others as a way for people to have spiritual space to think about racial violence that's occurring all around us. We've spoken about gun violence here in our community. We organized a place for local Christian leaders to come together to hear from victims of violence as well as the Seattle police to bring these issues into their congregations. Uh, we've organized peace marches to, in, in light of uh, violence. Uh, we've heard from Pastor Rob Schenk, who is the, um, the, the subject of a, a movie called Armor of Light to talk about violence as well. 
all of this comes out of who we were. So all these wonderful stories, all these expressions of who we are as a church are simply continuations of who we were as a church. The strength of our church is not me. And it's not from the last year or the last eight years. It goes back all the way to 1904. And that's something that I want us all to recognize. That while we do not want to be shackled by our past, we will strive to remain connected to it and to continue the work that God has been doing here. We are not a new church, and we will never be a new church as, as far as I know. And I want all of us to realize that we gain strength from these stories. We gain strength from these names. And so I want us to invest some time into knowing these stories and to saying, hey, tell me the story about Leonard Root doing this or about Gilbert Beckwith or about Naomi Cotton or Lola Gibson or all these saints who have done all of this work because that is who we are as a church. And there's a really important reason that we all need to double down on this, that we all need to start asking these questions and we, start need to, we need to start plugging into this story is because a generation is passing before our eyes. We have um, mourned and celebrated many memorials in the past few years. Our sister, Ron Kam, who is part of our Lao Fellowship, passed away a few years ago. Many of you were part of her service. Gilbert Beckwith and his wife also have passed away, although they continue to bless us through a memorial fund they established here at our church. Our dear sister Edith Root, who welcomed so many generations of people to our church, passed away a few years ago. And Leonard moved, uh, her, her husband moved away to Colorado to be closer to family. Naomi Cotton moved away to be in assisted living. Um, Lola Gibson as well. And sadly, uh, Ken Butts, who I just talked about, who's fingerprints spiritually and physically are all over this church took his last breath uh, yesterday um, after fighting COVID two times and pneumonia as well. Uh, died at 99 years old. 99 years old. That generation is passing away um, from 1955 to 2022. All of those stories, all of that history, all of that, those memories are, are vanishing. And so we as people are stepping into the story, we need to take some time to reconnect to that as well. We need to tell these stories so that we don't think, oh, we're a new church, we're gonna do something brand new, but that we would, like the Galatian church, feel like, no, these are names that are important to us. These are stories that are important to us. Not that we're shackled to them, but that we find depth and richness to them. And so I would ask all of us, whether you've been at RAC for 20, 30 years, or maybe this is your first time, that we would all commit to the story of who we are as a church. Not simply to the values and the ideas of who we are, but those names and those amazing moments of perseverance and courage that have been expressed time and time again in this place. With that, I'm going to ask the worship team to come forward, and I'm going to pray for us just that we would honor the story and the people who have come before and recommit ourselves to these stories as well. Let's do that in prayer. Dear God, we want to remember, Lord, that um, we're not here because, just because of ourselves and because of what we've done. We're here because of you and your Holy Spirit. On Pentecost Sunday, we want to freely confess we are here by the power of your Holy Spirit. But in addition to that, not just your Spirit, but the saints who have come before us people who have sacrificed money and time and tears and life in this space. And so we want to remember them. We want to celebrate them, God. And we want to be connected to those stories, God. We want to see ourselves not as the, the, new, the, the only generation of Rainier Avenue Church, simply the newest one. Help us to take effort and time to celebrate those who have come before us and to connect ourselves to those stories so that we would feel older and richer and more deeply planted than we would otherwise, God. And we honor all these people who have done so much and invested so much in the life of our church. God, we pray that they may feel honored and loved and know that their sacrifices and their investments um, didn't fall into fallow ground, but instead we are who we are because of who they were. Thank you, Jesus, for those stories. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.